Let's move on from that to why is China so damn big? Now, I got to say something, okay? Yeah, I don't care about this now. They just want another Ukraine and Asia, in my opinion. I hope China takes it. No, I just, I love the idea of America being like, hey, man, I know the Ukraine thing is popping off, but like, let's try to do our very best to ensure that there's another, like there's, there's an even larger fucking catastrophe. Fuck it, YOLO. The empire is dying. Empire is dying, okay? Let's just fucking, let's just go out with a bang. Let's just have some fun while we're at it. You know what I mean? Let's freestyle a little bit. No, this shit's popping off anyway, right? Every country on this planet has a story about its founding. Whether it's about a group of rebels trampling the global superpower, or a pacifist delivering independence for the second largest country on the planet, the most powerful man of the 20th century. or some dude pulling out a sword from a rock, they're usually somewhat fabricated and polished ideas of where the country came from, what it stands for. But China's story is different. China's story is a new story. How many people have literally gotten complacent over this because it seems to happen all the time? I mean, we looked at like, we looked at the actual, um, we looked at what the actual like Taiwanese people feel about this issue. And it's not as like uh, black and white as American media covers it. And it's more so just like, please don't fuck this shit up. Don't rock the boat. And more so, yeah, we don't want China to fucking come over and, and, and forcibly take over the country. But also, despite its foundation, despite its foundation, and despite America's attempts of um, using Taiwan as a reactionary cudgel against the, the uh, growing presence and threat of a massive uh, communist country uh, during the Cold War, um, the people of Taiwan are just like... <coughs> uh. Oh, sorry, the people of Taiwan are more so. Uh, in the business of, you know, business as usual. Keep things the way they are. Taiwan enjoys freedom but the C uh, from the CCP, but recognizes it is one people with the Chinese people. And it is tightly controlled. It's a story that is being used as a weapon. A weapon to subjugate millions of people to eliminate ancient cultures, to expand China's borders farther than they've ever pushed before. It's a founding myth that can't be challenged within China, and it has been so heavily peddled and thoroughly implanted into the Chinese psyche that most people believe that China actually looks like this, and that it has always looked like this. But China doesn't look like this. China actually looks a lot more like this. But only if you look at the real history, the facts and the evidence, which is something you can't really do within China. So instead, the Communist Party has created and weaponized the myth of this over the past 70 years to erase these borders, to build islands, to threaten neighbors, and to undertake one of the largest assimilation projects. Bro, this is gonna, this is a fire video. This is a, already is a fire video in human history. It's a project that has cost them trillions of dollars and has been responsible for countless horrific human rights violations. All Listen, my, my controversial position on this is that like, <laughs> I'd rather have, I'd rather have people that are invested in regional dominance. I'd rather have global superpowers be more invested in regional dominance rather than fucking global dominance in the form of what America is doing. Okay, if both things are wrong and they are, there are morally abhorrent aspects of uh, said uh, realities, okay, I'd rather have people fucking deal with their own shit in their own backyard rather than what America does, which is a deal in China's backyard. The fuck? What do you what do you mean? You can't fucking simultaneously be an American guy and and turn around and be like, wow, I can't believe China is like building fucking uh, islands and shit 
and expanding its uh, territorial control. That's so crazy, which is why us, the United States of America, need to do something about it. Bro, do you know where you are on the map? What, what the fuck do you mean? All in the name of preserving a pretend version of history. A version that China believes will keep the Communist Party in power and make China the richest, most powerful country on Earth. And what's scary is it just might work. This is the history of the CCP. Xi Jinping does not want you to know. Several mosques have been destroyed in China's far western region of Xinjiang. 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 One of Xinjiang's holiest sites. Is not only cracking down on Muslims, but on other religions as well. One of the most common sites is the Chinese leader's smiling face. One of the world's most ambitious construction projects is going on in secret. We will not let foreign journalists visit those islands in the South China Sea. <laughs> CBC is actually giving Taiwan really favorable options, to be honest. Taiwan having its own military, no mainland officials there, but Taiwan officials welcome into the CPC. There's a cultural dimension to it where it's about face. They want to put the nail in the coffin of the century of humiliation. Okay. Oh my God. He's like, he's about to be like, hey, better help. Hey, is, uh, is... <laughs> Did my, did my video about Chinese dominance get you down? Go to betterhelp.com and you can talk to a chatbot about your depression. Well, you could hear me talk about it or we could go right to the horse's mouth and listen to this guy, Xi Jinping, who's probably the best salesman for the Chinese story. Here he is giving a speech where he starts out with his boldest claim of all, that China is this 5,000 year old civilization. With a history of more than 5,000 years, our nation created a splendid civilization. But according to his story, in 1840, outsider Europeans came in and tore apart his unified country. China was Americans are so jealous that their history doesn't even expand towards 300 years as such copium. You're literally just jealous at this point. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the world's greatest superpower currently, okay, not for long, but currently, only has like a, a, a fucking 200 plus year history and it was founded by a bunch of fucking psychotic, you know, uh, uh, penal colony survivors, okay? Wanted to do rapes and slavery and genocide. I'm, I'm sorry that, like, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, America doesn't have a robust history that goes beyond that. He's like, oh, man, I can't believe this. Like, yeah, it's one of the oldest fucking empires. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Plunged into the darkness of domestic turmoil and foreign aggression. And now China is fighting back. We must be ready to fight, build our ability, and keep striving to secure new victories in this struggle. So the modern Communist Party of China is engaged in a project to restore the greatness of China, to make China great again. Okay, right, but this is just a political speech. Wait, so what's only wrong when other countries kill Muslims? No, what China did is fucking completely unacceptable in Xinjiang. Completely. Make no mistake. I've talked about this many, many times over. I've criticized uh, 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 Chinese, uh, um, the Chinese treatment of Uyghurs uh, many, many times. That is not a, that's not up for uh, debate or discussion. I'm talking about Something entirely separate from that. Beach. Why do we care if this guy's romanticizing the history a little bit? It doesn't really matter, right? No, actually, it does matter. Bam. Take a chill pill. What I want to show you is that Xi Jinping and the Communist Party use this story to justify terrible things. Mass assimilation of people to be controlled by the central government of Beijing. So to do this, let me just quickly go back and we can do a time lapse of this region of Asia and what it looked like over the past few thousand years to sort of fact check Xi Jinping. Here is China, cradle of civilization in Asia. What we think of as Chinese culture or Chinese civilization is really fucked up. They should have just let Japan take over. They should just let our trade partners um, cut China apart and just control it. Much more favorable that way, you know. That's what we should have. That's that's what we should have kept it uh, as. Has up, indeed honestly. been around for thousands of years. 
It was born here along the Yangtze River, where a lot of the language, political systems, writing, art, all of those traditions sort of originated. But from there, the idea of a contiguous unified China becomes kind of a myth. I'm going to put the modern borders of China on this map so that you can see what really is happening here. Over thousands of years, if you were to look at this territory, you would see all sorts of land configurations. Looking at this, you can see that China goes from these periods of unity to periods of total division over the past several John Harris be like, China's doing racism sweaty by saying all Asians are Han. Okay? Not all Han Chinese are Han, okay? That's called racism. Maybe you should balkanize China. Have you ever thought about that? Thousand years, China has gone from a bunch of divided kingdoms to periods of total unity where lots of good things happen. Technology, agriculture, unity, power. During times of division, bad things happened. The country was in chaos. There was destruction. There was war. There was... <laughs> so if this is true, then Europe is a fucking lie. Yes, brother. It belongs to the Mongolians. What the fuck do you mean? Dude. Finally, someone fucking said it, dude. God damn it. Yeah. Fucking finally, dude. Europe is a lie. It's just a, a string of barbarians that they fucking hold together with ticker tape and pedophilia and incest. The truth is that the Golden Horde owns Europe in its entirety. It belongs to the brave warriors from the steppes. I'm sick and tired of acting like Europe is real. Do you understand? Summon Genghis Khan. Summon Attila. And take over and restore order to the Angloid Horde that has taken over separated Turkic land. It's called Western Mongolia, damn it. Okay, let's continue. Johnny Harris said that Italians and Greeks can't recognize Roman and ancient Greek heritage. I don't know why. Like, there's obviously a lot of mythologizing that goes on when you talk about, like, you know, countries' histories and stuff. But, like, I didn't really think he was going to say, like, well, it's actually inappropriate that uh, they have, like, a, a consolidating way of approaching this. It's literally like if if Johnny Harris was making an argument against Turkey, being like, well, the Ottoman Empire is actually a sequence of different tribes. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, okay, so what? Like, like it, it's just it's just so fucking weird that you would look at like the actual history. Anyway, there's lawlessness. And this just keeps on happening for thousands of years, a seemingly endless cycle of unity and then division. Xi Jinping is very right that out of this region during some of these unified periods came like real serious advancements in shipping and math and like gunpowder and all of these things that like have informed how we've all developed as a world. This part of Eastern Asia was definitely on the forefront, but it was never one contiguous China for thousands of years. And the upshot was very clear. Bro, I mean, but like even then he described, like even when he's showing that this- was definitely on the forefront, but it was never- Even when never he's showing this, like there are different dynasties China. that literally fucking took over the yeah, entire land. Like what, who's to say? And also, who cares? Like, what the fuck? It's... Thousands of years. It just doesn't... Like, homie's looking at, like, 500 years. And the... Yeah, I mean, here, he just, like, he skips it. But, like, look at this. It's a filler video, dude. You keep being surprised by shitty writing quality of Harris. He's, <laughs> it's always funny when someone just like describes how countries are formed at a time when there's like 
uh, you know, at a, at a time during empires. And he's like, yeah, this is like fucking crazy. And the upshot was very clear. Unity meant prosperity and technology and all these good things. And disunity equals chaos and bad things. Okay, so it's now the 1700s. And over in Europe, the new fad is imperialism. 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 Right, yeah. It's European countries who are looking for more land so that they can expand their borders, send their armies, and everyone's doing it. It's the French, it's the British, it's the Spanish, it's even the Japanese are starting to get on board with this. And over here, in today what we call China, they had once again slipped into a period of serious disunity. They were divided. But this time, it came with an extra dose of humiliation. It's not for nothing that the period stretching around 100 years from the 1840s to the 1940s is known as China's century of humiliation. This era He's like, that shit was poggers, they should go back to that. Disunity in China came from outsiders. You can see this political cartoon. All of these barbarians at the door vying to carve up and slice up China for their own profit. China was once again in the dumps. And it was here, while European and Japanese powers were dividing up their land, that China learned its second crucial lesson. Not just that unity is better, but that if you want to survive in this brave new world, you have to play by the new rules. And those rules were very clearly laid out by these European empires. Defined borders, a patriotic agenda, assimilating other cultures into their own. This was the playbook the Europeans the record, were playing. Like, imperialism brought centralization to many of the fucking colonies. Um, there's always obvious, there's also a lot of stuff that he's like overlooking or the brutality that he is not uh, talking about. But like, Every country took those lessons. Every country, every country that was was um, a colony, literally learned about the impact of centralization and used it to develop their own nationalist, nation-building projects. That's why nationalism is not. That's why. And and by the way, centralism predates what Johnny Harris is saying for China. I'm not like super well read on the history of like Chinese empires. Right. But even if you look at his own fucking video, you see an effort for centralization throughout different dynasties. Right. But if you're talking about if you're talking about like um, specifically, if you're talking about like imperialism or, uh, or colonialism and uh, this video completely uh, ignores the King dynasty for a reason, it makes his entire video incorrect. Even if, even without that, pronounced Qing Dynasty. Okay, even even without that, it still sh it still betrays the main argument that he's trying to make, which is like it, the main argument he's trying to make, which is like centralization is a uh, is a uh, uh, came at the cost of like uh, uh, I guess e uh, survival from imperialism. Playing by, and it was working. Okay, so fast forward now, it's like the 1900s. It's the beginning of the communist revolution that would eventually envelop this entire country. The communist leaders were small still at this point, and they used this century of humiliation and division, as well as this general lesson of unity equals prosperity, to rally the people for a new cause. The revolutionaries are like, we've been sliced up and divided by all of these foreign powers, and when we're divided, we fail. Remember, exhibit A, B, and C. So these communist leaders went off and created this grand vision of a united China, a story that China had actually always been united. They framed it in terms of this former glory of what China used to be, what it was before the outsiders came in, a grandiose vision of the past that never really existed. I mean, again, this sounds pretty darn familiar. We will make America strong again, proud again, safe again. Oh my god, bro. Are you fucking serious?
He's comparing a real estate developer television host to Mao. <laughs> That's awesome. Again, great again. And that became the grand plan of the communist revolution in China, to make China united again, despite the fact that China had never really been fully united. Not like this, but the story, this vision was a potent rallying cry. China would never be cut up again, never humiliated. They would have defined borders, ethnic purity, cultural assimilation. And so for the last 70 years, that's the great project that China and the Communist Party have been undertaking, creating their own great empire controlled by a central authority. This project has coincided with China getting rich, pulling 100 million people out of poverty and becoming a global superpower, all just in a few decades. All of this- Okay, but like, this seem, this reads almost like pro-Trump. Like, like the way I look at this video, like, if you don't have like a like a automatic anti-China predisposition, it literally reads like promotional material for Chinese prosperity as a consequence of like their anti-imperialist endeavors, which is, of course, not how most people are going to approach this subject matter because they're like kind of bad across the board. But like. That you could you could unironically be like, yeah, no, Trump is actually good because he's also anti-imperialist. Or uh, or uh, comparing China to, uh, comparing uh, Chinese uh, nationalist efforts in in nation building, after being gutted by uh, uh, you know a century of of imperialists destroying it and cutting out their carving out their lands, to Donald Trump. has given the government a lot of resources with which to execute their project of forcefully uniting a swath of land that isn't and has never been united. And I want to show you what that looks like. The issue of China ruling over autonomous regions is controversial. So what are China's autonomous regions and are they really all that autonomous? This oh, I used to is work the with map her. that most people are familiar with when they think of China. But this outline doesn't tell you the whole story because nearly half of this land is considered autonomous super jargony turn. What does that even mean? There are over 56 ethnicities in China, most of them concentrated far away from Beijing, like over here in Tibet or over here in Xinjiang. When those communist leaders were setting up their new unified China empire, they kind of admitted like, okay, there are a lot of cultures and languages. And so what's up? China fucked up because um, they didn't do Puerto Rico? Like, what do you mean? I mean, I guess he's like anti, I mean, I, I'm sure he's like pro Puerto Rican uh, liberation as well, probably Hawaii. I mean, fucking half the states, brother. Like, what do you mean? Like, we are the United States of America. identities within this country, we should let these people govern themselves. Not entirely, of course. They still have to answer to Beijing with certain things, but they would have autonomy, autonomous regions. But many of these semi-autonomous regions like Xinjiang, Tibet, and Southern Mongolia, these places were never originally a part of any conception of China. They were forcefully absorbed by the Chinese Communist Party during its nation building project, like in the past 70 years. Okay, let's get specific here. Xinjiang is a region that is very far from Beijing, not just geographically, but also culturally. It is a huge region, roughly the size of Alaska, has 25 million people, and half of those people... Listen. I'm an advocate for allowing... Um, different, like, ethnic enclaves or uh, autonomous regions to exist, especially if the people in it choose to separate. Okay. But he's talking about fucking um like he's he's literally talking about fucking uh uh what do you call it like a like a nation state that existed like a thousand years ago. No, not like 
beat time but like i mean it's it, he's making it seem as though like he's making it seem as though there is Like he, when you talk about fucking, uh, the, the Chinese empire or Chinese dynasties, when you're talking about Chinese dynasty, like you're literally glancing over fucking thousands of years of history as though it's happening in the core over the course of like 30 years. Identify as Uyghur, which are mostly Muslims who are from a Turkic descent, not like a Han Chinese descent. They come from a different culture. The street signs are not in any Chinese language. They're in like the Uyghur Turkic language. The architecture looks a lot more at home in like Istanbul than it does in Beijing. And five times a day, the streets fill with the sound of prayer. Xinjiang was an independent republic twice before, but eventually it was overthrown by China. Eight years after China grabbed Xinjiang, the Chinese government did the same thing to an even more remote region at the highest plateau in the world, Tibet. They annexed this place that is three times the size of Texas. It has its own very distinct language, culture, identity, and does not identify or connect with Beijing. And back in the day, again, when China wasn't rich and powerful, they couldn't really wrangle these regions until suddenly they got rich really fast. Second How'd that happen? Only to the United States. How'd that happen? And for the past 30 to 40 years, China has been pouring money and people into these two regions to make them more like China. It's kind of like the geopolitical version of gentrification. It's basically where non-Chinese societies are subsumed by societal norms of Han Chinese culture because of a bunch of militarization and money. So in Tibet, you see this in the Tibetan schools that are only teaching in Mandarin, not in the traditional Tibetan language. Or you see it in Xinjiang where the mosques are torn down for being too Islamic and are rebuilt in traditional Chinese styles. Oh, and it starts to get a lot worse. In Xinjiang, the Uyghurs are literally taken away by the millions and forced into concentration camps where they're supposedly forcibly taught Chinese values. The government is involved in a mass sterilization project where they are forcibly inserting IUDs and other birth control forms to basically run them into extinction. And not just like 10 people, like millions of people. China originally gave these people autonomy because they- Holy shit, this is so wildly inaccurate. No, the part about Xinjiang, and I know everyone's gonna say like Adrian Zen's propaganda, Adrian Zen's propaganda, or like fake photos or whatever the fuck, but like, you no, know, there is, residential schools is a great example of like, of, of, or, or, an, or analogous to what, uh, the, the honification, or at least like, uh, the forced, uh, uh, cultural changes that were imp uh, implemented in uh, Xinjiang. And their, uh, their reason for doing that, or their claim for why they were doing that, was because they wanted to combat uh, separatist extremists, Muslim separatist extremists. That was the take. So, so much so that, like, Xi Jinping, everyone's favorite uh, supreme leader, quite literally openly stated that the reason they that they had learned how to deal with Muslim separatist extremism from the United States of America. This is a real fucking quote from Xi Jinping. Okay? So the idea that that's not the idea that that is not the case is ridiculous. They definitely had re-education cameras. They did. Not inaccurate chat. China is literally modern day right. No. Left is spamming about tankies in a chat room. Just admit you're a delusional child who only cares about aesthetics. <clears throat> every country has every country has expanded its borders under similar protocols. The only difference is China is doing it right now, and they're doing it as uh, as a nation state that is against the United States of America. Worse than that, they are a nation state most likely to overtake the U.S. global hegemonic power. That is precisely why you see so much anger and resentment. This does not make it appropriate. This does not make it acceptable, okay? And it, it certainly does not. But you don't have to fucking cope for it. It doesn't make it okay. But you don't have to also, uh, you know, turn around and try to justify it.
recognized that they had it's fine for israel though no of course not of course it's not fine for israel either their own culture and they wanted to retain it but now they've totally thrown that deal out the window the way this presents most commonly in these regions is just the presence of military and police there are checkpoints everywhere there's restricted movement there's constant surveillance and every year that passes by it becomes harder these people resist they fight back they commit acts of terror and in response China sends more military, more police, and more surveillance equipment. In 2018, I mean, that part China spent already. $10 billion in security. In what he's describing is done already. They have successfully culturally cleansed Xinjiang. And that's not my takes as a China defender or anything like that. But absolutely the Associated Press's take. The Associated Press, a couple months ago, came out with an article saying that the, um, the, the, uh, what do you call it? That the trade schools, which were re-education camps, um, had, had, uh, closed up their fucking doors and that they had turned, uh, Xinjiang's, like, once robust culture of, Uyghur uh, Muslims and Uyghur Muslim existence into a Disneyland ride. Okay. But well, let's continue. In Xinjiang, that's almost double the year before and 10 times as much as it was 10 years previous. Three billion of those dollars go into these re-education camps. That's four times more than the previous year. I mean, it's, it's ramping up. They're pouring money into these regions. Per person, China spends 3,100 yuan on security in Tibet, 2,400 in Xinjiang per person. Compare that to the national average of 763 yuan per person, and you can see that every single person in these regions is worth a lot more in terms of- um. Okay. I feel like he got these numbers directly from... I mean, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but... Um... Surveillance state still very much exists all over China, especially so in Xinjiang. The spending is not over. Paywall articles, so archive... Oh. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. For sure. The, the Chinese surveillance state uh, uh, in, in Xinjiang is fucking insane. It sounds like you defend China's ethnic cleansing in Xinjiang because you refuse to play the top of the hour ad break, a crime against humanity. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck yourself. At the top of the hour, there's a six second ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. What you can do for $5, I don't know how many yuan that is, or for free with a Twitch Prime. By connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, you get one free Prime subscription a month. You can also get gifted a sub if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, you make your own luck by using a Twitch Prime, which is how you, uh, and the way to do that is by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Like I said, here's the woman I break now. One chat, two systems. Um, for the record, as far as like uh, China's surveillance state, the original inception of the surveillance state in Xinjiang is absolutely, infinitely more suppressive than uh, the world's largest CCTV per capita uh, uh, area, which is London. It's even higher than fucking Xinjiang, for the record, for those of you who don't know. It is. It literally is higher. There are more cameras 
per capita inside of London than there are in Xinjiang. However, the way that they utilize the surveillance state in Xinjiang is significantly more oppressive. That does not change the reality that like the same security concerns or the same argument that Johnny Harris is making, you could quite literally make in this day and age towards the United States of America and its own police force. The reason why I'm mentioning this is not to defend China, but instead to help you understand that this is a fundamental role of what nation states do. Okay? This is, this is just what... One thing that people always do, one thing that people always fucking love to do when they're talking about uh, a country that is, um, you know, uh, seen as like a foreign adversary, especially in the West, is to basically take things that we here in the United States of America criticize about the United States, okay, and then apply it to China or apply it to Russia in the exact same fucking lens. Like, New York Times, when talking about China, sounds like a fucking, like, straight-up crusty anarchist. Like, the crustiest, okay? They will literally look at, like, they'll write an article about a museum and be like, I can't believe they are whitewashing their history. It's like, motherfucker, you're the New York Times. What is your purpose on this planet, if not to do that exact same thing, but for America and American history? Right? So, when you are criticizing China, if you want to criticize it like you are a leftist Chinese person, okay, then you have to still understand that um, the exact same things that they're doing, America is doing and has done and continues to do, okay, which is my criticisms of China. My criticisms of China revolve around what uh, the, the same exact aspects that America engages in that I despise. Okay, another white dude ranting about China. Yeah, I know. I'm another white dude. I'm all xenophobia. Shut the fuck up, bitch. China's the most powerful nation on the planet. Suck my dick. <laughs> I love... By the way, that, unironically, is the same exact bullshit that, like, conservatives do. Oh, man. Oh, man. You're being fucking... <laughs> you're being real anti-Christian white, uh, white right now. Like, what do you mean? They fucking dominate, bitch. What are you talking about? And I don't even have, I don't even hate it. Like, I don't even have a problem. I love high-speed rail. Shut the fuck up. You can't hit me with that fucking xenophobic bullshit, especially when China belongs to the fucking... A great wall was built. They called it the greatest wall. One that could be seen from the sky. The Turanist forces and the Khanate, the Golden Horde. That's who China truly belongs to. Do you understand? We will tear down those walls and we will rid China of its Chinese influence to restore order. To the true mandate of heaven. Gökturk. The real mandate of heaven is that China and all of those lands belong to the warriors of the steppe. Okay, I gotta stop doing this. All right, let's continue. Of the cost of making them assimilate. So the question is why? Why is China doing this? Why are they investing so much money into occupying and forcibly assimilating these people? Well, there are several geopolitical and economic reasons why the Communist Party wants to do this. First off, the resources. Xinjiang produces 87% of the country's cotton, for example. And when it comes to Tibet, you can see that they provide a buffer between China and India. Tibet also has the largest fresh water supply in the world given where they are so high up. China also uses these regions as a part of their big infrastructure initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative. They use infrastructure to connect these regions to continue to fortify their economic- This is my favorite take. This is my favorite. Like, bro. I fucking love this take. Infrastructure, of course, in underdeveloped nations was literally used in colonies, was used as a way to, to 
basically create uh, appropriate trade routes so that you can do slavery more efficiently. In this circumstance, you're literally talking about it like if, if America fucking built roads in Puerto Rico and like rebuilt its infrastructure, okay? Could you imagine anyone, literally anyone, making an argument like, man, well, first of all, America is way more brutal than Puerto Rico and literally won't even build its infrastructure. But could you imagine uh, people being like, America is building, uh, America is going in and building Puerto Rican infrastructure so that uh, they don't get fucking owned anytime there's like a, a, a genuine uh, natural disaster that just like destroys the, the, uh, the entirety for, um, for, for months on end. You're being purposely obtuse about the Belt and Road Initiative? Oh, I've talked about Belt and Road Initiative many, many times. I was just talking about them building infrastructure in Xinjiang uh, and, and also uh, in, in Tibet and whatnot. I, I'm not even talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is, as it stands currently, and this is not my take, this is the take of like Foreign Policy Magazine, The Economist. These guys are not like insanely fucking pro-China, but still significantly more favorable to uh, the, the IMF as it stands currently. economic standing in the world. But I believe the real reason is this myth, this myth of a united China, because a united China is a strong China. A divided China is a chaotic China. This has been the rallying cry for 70 years, but it's not just assimilation within their borders. This myth has also fueled and justified China's adventures in expansion elsewhere. This is the South China Sea. China says it will fight to the very end to prevent Taiwan from being declared independent. The former British colony is being smashed into submission. So now you have China building islands in the South China Sea claiming that this entire ocean belongs to them? Oh, that's just China reclaiming what was rightfully theirs. Because after all, this ocean's been theirs for 5,000 years. They're just reclaiming it. Violating its promise to let Hong Kong stay independent and absorbing it into China piece by piece? Oh, that's just China restoring sovereignty over these islands that- Bro, the fucking news article literally said the former British colony. I- What? Um, come on, dude. Like, they were slated to fucking give it back to China, like, what, 20 years down the line? So they fucking accelerated it. Britain stole in like the 1800s. How about an invasion of Taiwan? Oh my God. Over these islands that Britain stole in like the 1800s. It's like Britain stole in 1800s. That's, that's, uh, you know, I guess that's not something you should be, uh, considering, you know, that was so long ago. You might as well let it be the way it is. But of course, if we're talking about fucking Chinese dynasties that, uh, you know, encompass like 500 400 years then that's like whatever that's like ancient history who gives a fuck uh, i don't understand like just chill out bro how about an invasion of taiwan to unite it forcibly with china all they're doing is restoring china back to the way it was but again this was never the case this is a yeah how did how did that happen originally like i said i'm not super well read on my chinese history but if I'm not mistaken, that was more of a role reversal, right? It was like a return to sender type situation. The Taiwan situation. You know, get better generals, dog. What do you mean? Like, you can't just fucking... You can't just be like, yeah, they got fucking... They got destroyed. They got rolled and smoked and dumpstered, and dumpstered by Mao. Uh, oops. Like, what, what are you talking about? That's insane. It's a story constructed 70 years ago to unify a country that was on the brink of collapse. This story today is weaponized and used by Xi Jinping and the Communist Party to justify almost everything that they're doing. Achieving national rejuvenation will be no walk in the park. 
It will take more than drum beating and the gong clanging to get there. Every one of us in the party must be prepared to work even harder toward this goal. Okay, so to end this, I just want to say one last thing, which is I have no interest in bashing on China and Chinese culture. There is so much beauty that comes from this region of the world. And as I mentioned, every one of the countries out there, including my own, are guilty of a weaponized history. The reason I'm concerned and focused on this is because this mythical fake story that China is using, it can't be fact-checked within China. So instead, the Chinese government is able to use this story. Oh, I love this. This is my favorite check. It's so lib. It's so libbed up. Like, hey man, we can fact check our fucking nation's history in America. What good does that do, dumbass? You got fucking Supreme Court justices, six of them, that just literally decided in the most ahistorical capacity that women cannot get fucking abortions. Like, a medical procedure that literally existed in the time of fucking the, our founders. Okay? So what? What good does fact-checking that do? It is such a fucking liptard-ass approach, dude. Like, oh yeah, if China was able to fact-check their history, man, things would be so different. Like, what, what do you... We, oh, <laughs> if there was only... If only there was a Chinese Glenn Youngkin who was, uh, you know, doing uh, giving four Pinocchios to Xi Jinping. Things would be so different. <laughs> um, actually, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Xi, five Pinocchios on that take. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, because China has such a good record on women and children. Dude, I never said that. Right now, we are united in shitting on people thinking that being able to fact check, uh, being able to fact check the government is going to change the fucking course of, of capitalist or supposedly communist governments. You're misunderstanding what I'm saying Go completely or wholeheartedly. Glenn Youngkin is governor? Yeah, I know. I fucked it up. Whatever. He's uh, the other dude. There was a guy. Remember the one that, like, fact-checked Bernie Sanders' uh, false claims about Medicare for all? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Glenn Kessler. Uh, yeah. Story as a weapon to justify the oppression of its people, the grabbing of land. And honestly, looking at it, how it's playing out, it's just a modern day. Oh yeah, he was fact checking a little too hard. Sometimes article heads go at it, go, go fucking bananas. 